Representative Latterell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, members of the House of Representatives. It's my honor today to bring before you House Joint Resolution 1002. It is a simple resolution to bring forward the idea that we as state legislatures want to get together with other states to discuss ways to restrain an overreaching federal government. So legislators have been given a unique role by the founders of our country in our U.S. Constitution. As they were closing out the Constitutional Convention in 1787, they knew that the day would come when the federal government exceeded the limits set for it in the Constitution. So the founders created a safety valve where you would be the last line of defense for liberty. And I don't mean that generically. I mean you, today, state legislators in South Dakota. The Constitution gives you, and only you, ultimate power over the federal government. So the only question before us today is will we have the courage to use the power given to us by our founders or give in to the fear being peddled by some naysayers? That's the choice we face today. And the only argument used by some of our friends, friends who love this country, they love the Constitution as much as we do, is that we should be scared. So I'd ask you this question. When the Minutemen took their positions on the battlefield in Lexington against the Redcoats, who were marching toward them, did they operate based on fear or based on courage? When the framers of the Constitution met in 1787, did they operate on the basis of fear or courage? There is a simple, nonpartisan question that's being addressed here. It's not an issue of left or right, actually. It's a question of right and wrong. It's a question of who decides. And 72% of Americans believe today that the federal government is too big, does too much, and has too much influence on their lives. We're not just talking Democrats and Republicans. With numbers like this, this is a broad scope of the political spectrum. And what the people are saying to us is this. We want the majority of the decisions that affect our lives to be made at home to be made specifically locally here in South Dakota. 80% believe the federal government shouldn't be allowed to deficit spend our grandchildren's future into oblivion. That's reasonable. And 80% believe in some form of term limits. Not everyone thinks that's a good move, but maybe 24 years is enough years in Congress. It certainly works for the president. We are not uh, advocating to change that. So in America, who decides? It's not really a debate that we have in America, but it is a debate that we should have and that we must have, because right now we're operating on the presumption that Washington, D.C. decides. And this, this Convention of States process, meeting with other states, is the only legal and peaceful stool, tool that we have to start that conversation. And it's important that we all understand the math here that the founders put into the Constitution. They were wise guys. They knew that it should be difficult to actually propose and ratify amendments to the Constitution. They said, well, nothing will be ratified unless it's a mainstream American idea that has broad support across the political spectrum. So I think we all know how hard it is to pass things by two-thirds vote in this body. Imagine how difficult it would be to get three-fourths of all 50 states to agree to something. That means it only takes 13 states to stop any bad amendment that would happen to be proposed by the meeting with the other states. So whether you're on the left or whether you're on the right, there's plenty of states in either column to stop any unreasonable amendments that could possibly be proposed. The safeguards are very simple. So what do the 13 states have to do to stop such a resolution that would be proposed or an amendment that would be proposed? It's really simple. They have to do nothing. They simply don't ratify the amendment. They don't take it up. So nothing radical from either side can make it into our Constitution. So if we don't pass this resolution today, we know for certain what's going to happen. The federal government will continue to tell us how to educate our kids. It'll tell us how to shut down our power plants, tell us what we can't do with our water, which land we're allowed to use, how we use it, how we raise our crops, how we raise our livestock, what kind of health care we can or can't have and how to spend our money. And they'll continue to bankrupt the country and saddle our kids and grandkids with unending debt 
and push our economy towards the brink of collapse. Thank you. But if we do pass this today, then what can we see? Well, we'll be joining, with, yields. We'll be joining with the other states in calling for a meeting to discuss ways to return the power back to this body and back to the people. So we can propose an amendment that ensures local decisions for local issues. And if that amendment has a wide support of the American people, it will pass, and we will have exercised the tool that the founders expected us to use when we found ourselves dealing with an overreaching federal government. So I appreciate the opportunity to bring this before you today. I think it's a wonderful uh, effort that's happening. There are 1.2 million grassroots supporters supporting this specific resolution. And I would encourage your green vote. I'll stand by for questions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Further remarks? Further remarks, House Joint Resolution 1002. Representative Stalzer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. One of the main objections that uh, some of the people have had for this particular amendment, um, and I'm not sure that the uh, good uh, representative from Lincoln County uh, brought all of these up, but there are three parts to this particular one. One is to rein in the federal government and basically restore the Tenth Amendment, the state's rights. It also calls for fiscal restraint or balancing the federal budget and also calls for term limits for federal uh, office holders. In fact, the term limits portion of it is already still in the South Dakota Constitution. But I've been involved in a number of organizations nationally that have been working on this to make sure that any convention that's called will have a good outcome and will not be what the opponents are saying is a runaway convention. Um, I've been involved with the, the Balanced Budget Amendment Task Force, the uh, Federalism Task Force from Malik, and I've had a personal relationship with uh, the attorney Rob Nadelson, who is uh, the primary attorney who has been working in this area, and also the Assembly of State Legislatures. And I'll talk more about the Assembly of State Legislatures because that's the one the representative from Lincoln County and I were appointed to to represent this body to make sure that what is done in a um, convention of sta states to propose amendments is it to the best interest of the state of South Dakota. We had a meeting most recently in Salt Lake City in early November, and there were some proposed rules that uh, good representative from Lincoln County and I found totally unacceptable. And so we, along with some people from Florida, Tennessee, West Virginia, led the fight to straighten them out. The first thing is they wanted to have the vote based on the electoral college rather than one state, one vote. The, the rules that are proposed now do call for one state, one vote with no, res, uh, no reference whatever to the uh, electoral college and population taking part in that. Um, there were many instances where they wanted super majorities, which meant a small group could undermine the efforts of the, uh, the body as a whole. And we got those issues taken out. We got rules put in to allow states. We did a, a Delegate Limitation Act last year, which allows us and actually, specifically, it would come from leadership in the legislature, but the Secretary of State could notify them, and they would remove those delegates if they were rogue delegates and didn't follow the instructions given by their uh, state legislature that sent them there. So part of the rules do authorize or recognize the state of South Dakota's right to do that. And the last, last one I'm going to speak about here is one that recognizes that since it takes two-thirds of the states to call for a convention that only those items that are uh, on the call of 34 states or two-thirds of the states can be even addressed at the convention, and they would uh, be ruled out of order in the event that that was not the case. Uh, that one happens to be my resolution that uh, was was adopted. but. 
as, as the good representative said, it only takes one body in 13 states to stop a bad uh, proposal that would come out. And I would uh, contend that every day Congress meets, we're at more risk than we would be if the 50 states got together to try to rein in the federal government. I would again also ask for your uh, green vote. Thank you. Further remarks, Representative Hoggard. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would just point out that it seems as though every time we speak with our congressional delegation, they express the same frustrations. You know, and they don't specifically ask for us to do this, but I think privately they probably would. But the fact is they're finding they're unable to do anything about federal regulations and things are just completely out of control in that realm. And that's why we're facing these issues with a power plant here in South Dakota and, and, and so many of the things that we deal with are in regard to federal regulations that come down and have an impact on South Dakota. So some of the simple things to say in regard to a constitutional convention or anything close to that would be the, the slogans that uh, I've heard recently, the fear of a runaway convention versus the fact of a run, runaway Congress. And that's what we have is a runaway Congress, runaway bureaucracy. And there's no way to rein this in unless we have a balanced budget in the federal, uh, federal system. The other uh, simple point to make is that the Supreme Court is an ongoing constitutional convention. As we saw, they addressed the issue of the very issue of marriage last year and came up with an absurd uh, result in their, their uh, written decision. So it's time for us to do something, and for us not to use the provisions of the Constitution is, is not what the, the Founding Fathers intended. They, they placed those things there for a purpose, and we need to recognize we should be acting and doing something proactive instead of standing by wishing it were different. So I just urge your green vote on this as well. Further remarks, House, House Joint Resolution 1002. Representative Ring. Well, Mr. Speaker, I don't have much to say about runaway conventions or any of that. But one part of this proposal would require a balanced budget. And I talked about this a lot last a year ago. I won't talk about it again uh, in, in as much detail because it is crossover day. But I do want to read one quote that was uh, signed by a uh, uh, resolution was signed by um, almost a thousand economists, including 11 Nobel laureates a few years ago. We condemn the proposed balanced budget amendment to the federal constitution. It is unsound and unnecessary. The proposed amendment mandates perverse actions in the face of recessions. In economic downturns, tax revenues fall and some outlays such as unemployment benefits rise. These built-in stabilizers limit declines, in other words, they stabilize the economy. To keep the budget balanced every year would aggravate recessions. It's not that we think deficits are a good thing. In fact, I won't read the next quotes, but it's in favor of a balanced budget. Um, but an annually balanced budget would be disastrous. I'd be remiss as an economist if I didn't at least point that out here. Thank you. Further remarks? Representative Bolin. Well, thank you. Very briefly, in our current situation, doing nothing and voting this down is a bigger risk than passing it and doing something. Please vote yes. Thank you. Does anyone wish to speak for a first time before Representative Latterell speaks for a second time? Representative Latterell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, members of the House. If you're thinking, you know, I don't trust, I don't trust us. I don't trust the state legislatures or the people that they would send to a meeting like this. You're in effect saying, you know, even though the runaway U.S. Congress has the authority today to propose these kinds of amendments, they have it tomorrow, they have it every day of the week, at the meeting that they're having, they're still not proposing any crazy amendments. Because it's difficult to come to consensus on that kind of thing. And uh, to address the point that was brought up, you know, this resolution says that we could discuss fiscal restraints on the federal government. It doesn't say that we would have a one-year balanced budget or anything draconian of that nature. So, you know, he also mentioned that we've already passed the Delegate Limitation Act, which binds the delegates and makes sure that we, they are operating under our authority. They only follow the instructions we give them. 
and they only discuss the topics that we authorize to. Patrick Henry, in his famous speech, Liberty at Death, said, I have but one lamp by which my feet are guided, and that is the lamp of experience. I know of no way of predicting the future except by the past. So now to paraphrase, what is it in the conduct of the federal government that leads anyone here to believe that they will begin to lessen their intrusions into the rights of South Dakotans to decide for themselves? So what is it that leads you to believe or us to believe that without a convention of the states, without a meeting of the states, that they'll stop telling us what to do with our kids and our land and our environment and energy and most importantly, our religious freedom? So a vote for this resolution is quite simply a vote to get together in conversation with the other states to discuss how do we bring the power back to the citizens of South Dakota, along with the citizens of the 49 other states. Self-governance is our birthright, paid for with the blood of our ancestors, and they gave us, just us, the state legislators, the power and the moral obligation to reign in the federal government which has exceeded its enumerated powers. So it's time that we stand the same way our forefathers stood against an overbearing central government far away and say, enough is enough. Only today, thanks to the provisions in Article 5, we have the opportunity to do it peacefully and constitutionally through the tool they gave us in the very constitution we revere. So today's a day for bravery, not fear. Today is a day for action, not paralysis and inaction against federal overreach. It's far more dangerous to do nothing. We all know the current trajectory. Therefore, in the name and memory of the founders of this great nation, I respectfully ask you to support this resolution to call the Convention of States they predicted you would need to call someday. Today's that day. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.